Unfinished, The Mysteries of the Megaliths. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. So we have kind of an interesting and different show for you today. Uh, Cosmic Summit is coming up real fast, a couple of days for us. And uh, I'm going to be giving a presentation there. I, Kyle and I have gone through this presentation in its like primitive form <laughs> on this show before. Uh, and so we did we basically did a whole two hour show on it. Uh, but I have I've given it many times since then in front of groups of people on tours, and each time I do it, I refine it. And then for the Cosmic Summit, where it's actually like a formal setting, uh, I've and then I had a specific time limit. I spent some time working on it, and I also had to, before I always did it as just like a slideshow, I just pull up my photographs and just go through a series of photos, and I'm pointing at things with a laser pointer or whatever, but with the way this setup is, I have to build all of the illustrations into the presentation because I'm not going to be able to point. Um, So that required me to spend a lot of time working on the presentation itself, and actually, like, I had to go through each slide and think about it. What do I want to point out? How am I going to point it out when I can't actually point at it? You know, so it what a cost great exercise. Yeah, it cost me to refine the whole thing, and I'm actually I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, so it will be delivered at the Cosmic Summit. You can get live stream tickets to the Cosmic Summit, or you know, there's still physical tickets available if you want to go. Um, but this presentation would not be possible without you guys. Like, really, the podcast and all of you listeners, all of you guys supporting us, whether you're doing it monetarily or just listening or giving us your your talent, your treasure, your time. Uh, the fact that we were able to go to Egypt and get these photographs and have these insights that are included in this presentation is in large part because of you guys. So Kyle and I wanted to give this presentation to you so that you don't have to purchase it, Okay. If you want to support us and you want to see everything else that's going to be going on at the summit, because there's going to be a lot of cool presentations, a lot of great presenters, and lots of actual scientists there, including Ben, uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, you can still get a live stream. I will put the uh, our live stream affiliate link into the show notes. So if you want to buy a live stream ticket for fifty dollars and also support us, because we get a, a, a small cut of it, you can click on that link and purchase it. You can watch it live and interact. There's going to be chats. People are going to be paying attention. You can ask questions of the presenters that way. At least that's what I'm told. If you can't see it live, it'll be available to you in perpetuity as videos later on. I mean, so you, you know, even if you can't make it live, you can buy the ticket and then you can watch them whenever you want. But this presentation I'm giving is possible because of you guys. And we wanted to give it to you free of charge. So. This is not obviously going to be exactly what I do at the Cosmic Summit because I'll be in front of a crowd. It's going to be a whole stage setting, but I'm basically showing you the entire presentation that that include all of Kyle and I's insights about this particular subject and then my constructed version of the presentation. That's what's coming up here. I do want to apologize for those of you who normally just listen to the show. This is a very visual presentation. It, it It's... Everything I'm saying is in reference to the visuals, the photographs, the the graphics that are coming up, the arrows that I'm drawing on things. So I'll put a timestamp <laughs> just this once <laughs> in the show notes for those of you who just get too frustrated and you can skip forward uh, past the whole visual presentation where Kyle and I are going to do, we have a, you know, a dis- an afterward discussion and then we'll read some emails and just do the normal show stuff for the second hour. Uh, but I really rec- recommend that you go and watch the YouTube version because we're going to put it on YouTube. It's going to show all the visuals and everything, and it's 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 a really good presentation. So it is, yeah, it's great, man. You did a good job. Well, thank you. I've been begging for diagrams, and he, he's got some great diagrams. <laughs> I drew in some diagrams. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I ever wanted. <laughs> I, I told I, I wanted Kyle to make wooden models. I wanted to make wooden models, but I am I have not done that. <laughs> and I didn't do that. <laughs> I did do that. It, it showed up. All right. Well, 
It's only a model. <laughs> I didn't have any models, <laughs> and I was like, it's way too late for us to build physical demonstrations. It's so I'll just, you know, I'll just make some drawings. Yeah, yours doesn't work. I, I guess it doesn't why. work. All right. It's, golly, now it's double the problems. All right, zero mistakes. Zero uh, mistakes. Here comes the presentation. It's fantastic. Go to YouTube and watch it. Yeah. Here we go. This is the podcast version of the presentation that I will be giving at the Cosmic Summit. We actually, we wanted to release this to you guys first. Um, so this presentation we've done before on the show, but this is the, uh, uh, this is a refined version. And I think at this point that unfinished is a good name for this presentation, because no matter what <laughs> I do to it, it seems to not quite be complete. <laughs> And every time I've delivered it, it's been different from each time before, and it'll be the same here. So I'm I'm going to show you the version, the visual version that I have for the Cosmic Summit, and we'll go through it. I'm really happy and uh, happy with this presentation, I'm, and I'm kind of proud of it. So of course, we are going to be looking at Egypt. We're going to start with uh, the Giza Plateau, and you know just a few things about Egypt that you guys have heard us say before, but going there and seeing these sites in person just completely changes the way you think about them. It, it, it forces it upon you, and it's amazing. And the partially destroyed nature of a lot of the sites allows you to kind of see through the construction methods behind, sort of behind the scenes in a way, to, to and then get a look at the mind of the builders because you're seeing their techniques. And, you know, I'm sure many of you have this... Uh, had this experience where maybe you have a house and you're and you're looking like something breaks and then you're like looking behind the one you're like what did that what were they thinking when they did this right here in this particular part of the house at least if you've ever been in construction you know this very well you know you go in to fix something for somebody in some building and you open it up and you're like what was the last guy who was working on this thinking when he did this part and it you can see into the minds of the people who were working on the things before so that's what we saw in Egypt so again here we are starting with the Giza plateau this is a top down view just to orient ourselves, all of you guys are familiar with this great pyramid, or the Pyramid of Khufu, considered to be 4th Dynasty Old Kingdom, early 26th century BC. And then the Middle Pyramid, or the Pyramid of Khafre, 4th Dynasty Old Kingdom, considered to have been built in the mid-26th century BC. But the one we're interested in for this pr uh, presentation is... The small pyramid, this one right here. So let's take a closer look at that. The Pyramid of Menkara, or Menkara. Fourth Dynasty Old Kingdom, considered to have been built in the late 26th century BC. So you can see all three of these pyramids were built, considered to have been built in the 26th century within 100 years of each other. This pyramid is very interesting. Let's take a look at the, this is the walkway leading up to the north face of it. This pyramid is very interesting, and I wanted to get over here when we were first there because of the casing stones, these right here that you can see. These casing stones are sort of unique. The other pyramids were also cased, but they were mostly cased in a very hard kind of limestone called tura. Tura is high in silicates, uh, so it is limestone, a sedimentary rock, but having so much silicates in it, it is a very hard stone and it, it is protective, but this is granite. These casing stones are made of granite. I'm gonna get a little closer here. And you can also see the sort of heterogeneous nature of the casing. This is really interesting and uh, it's similar to what we see in other places like in Peru, but this also shows you, uh, it's, it's very interesting how this once again shows you a, in some of the ways about what the builders were thinking. Because the bulk of the pyramid, the core material that we're seeing up above the casing stones there is limestone, just regular limestone. It's soft. Uh, it, these are multi-ton blocks, you know, and they are also heterogeneous. They're not all the same size. They're different shapes. They have different angles. The, the main thing that stays the same as you go up are the layers. So the heights of each set of blocks are the same, 
but the layer, the heights of each individual layer differ from the ones above and below it. So they, they still, even though they were doing a, a, a very even layering, they kept the heterogeneous nature of the structure by changing the heights of the layers. So they're all different as you go up. And there's probably, there's probably a system to it. I'm not sure I've ever seen anybody study that. Is there a system? Does it go up and down? Uh, or, the, or is it more random? But looking again at the casing stones, if you're making the core of the pyramid out of a much easier to work stone like limestone, well, that stone is also softer and it's more susceptible to the elements. So you want to protect the pyramid with a kind of roof. So the casing stones act as a form of roof. And unfortunately, over time, they also, the pyramids themselves and especially the casing acted as a quarry for later people who came along. So there's not many of the casing stones left because this granite is actually sourced from around 500 miles away up the Nile. Uh, so it's difficult to get if you're in this, if you live in this area and you're an ancient person and you want a millstone or you want a, a granite uh, lintel or something like that, uh, this is a much easier method to get granite than it is to travel 500 miles up the Nile to, to where the granite is actually exposed near the Nile. So people have been quarrying this pyramid and the other ones for a long time. So there's not very many of the casing stones left, but fortunately, a lot of their quarrying rubble piled up against the base of the pyramid and actually ended up protecting the layers that we see here. And you can see some of the rubble off to the right there and there's more off to the left. It's been cleared away by archaeologists to expose this area, the entrance, the known entrance to the pyramid. Also, quick note, that huge hole above this is actually an attempt to destroy the pyramids that was made. <laughs> uh, and they worked on that for about eight months and decided this is way too hard. Um, and they, they quit. So, yeah, uh, long effort to destroy the pyramids that didn't work out. But this section right here in front of the pyramid that I've got circled is the entrance. And there's a very interesting phenomena happening in the casing stones right there that we'll take a closer look at in a minute. First, let's look at the stones themselves. This gives you a kind of scale. Lots of these pictures I have in here are designed to show you the scale because, again, it's, it is difficult to, to actually appreciate the enormity of the size of some of these stones that we're going to be looking at. And this helps you a little bit. So you can see like a person standing on the ground there, their head basically comes up to the around to the top of the second layer of casing stones. And that's only because the, the, the bottom layer isn't fully completely dug out of the sand. If it was completely dug out to the bottom of that layer, you would not even be that tall. So this is showing you the scale. And you can also see that the, the blocks are unfinished on the face. So what would have been, what is the outward facing side of these stones is definitely rough, unfinished. They're kind of puffy or pillowy looking. That's what we call it, it's pillowy. Uh, and they have lots of interesting features that we can we can look at. Like uh, right up here, you see a bunch of nubs. These are easily recognizable. There's also a whole set of them above that, right along there. And again, take note of the scale of these stones. You can see where people standing in front of them. These are, these are really big blocks. And since this is granite, it's very heavy. So we're talking... I mean, I don't know what the estimated weights on these, but I would say tens of tons on some of them at least. Here's another set of interesting marks. So reverse nubs, possibly. Not sure, but these all a lot of these look like uh, mechanisms for maneuvering the blocks. I wouldn't say lifting necessarily, but maneuvering maybe. And uh, another thing to note is that even though the front faces, the outward faces of these stones are unfinished, they're puffy or pillowy looking, rough, where the blocks actually sat up against each other and where they do sit up against each other is very finely finished. And this is just, this picture is just to give you an idea of that. You can see where these stones would have sat next to each other and they would have fit very well. And in some cases, it's really interesting. These surfaces aren't actually completely flat. They have slight curves, but then they match with the block next to them. The curve is matched somehow. It's very slight, but it's it's weird because this is not, it doesn't seem like the, an easy way to do it. You wanna cut it flat and then you fit it flat up against another box, a block, but that's not how some of these are done, at least the ones where we can see the sides. 
And this is a look at the flattened area in front of the, uh, around the entrance. And this is really why when we went to Egypt the first time and the second time and the next time we go, I always want to go over to this pyramid because of this area. And this is, I think that this is evidence that the people who were building this intended to flatten all of these granite blocks just like this. Uh, and they didn't finish the job. And the question is, why didn't they finish the job? I don't have answers to that, but I do think that as we go through this presentation, we'll see more and more evidence that people, that, that a lot of these enormous constructions that have similar patterns that we can recognize, like nubs or reverse nubs, enormous stones uh, made from very hard materials, and the, the people who were doing the job got close to the end of the project and were in the process of doing basically what you would what you would call the finishing work, flattening out the stones, polishing things. And then for some reason they stopped work and it's never been finished. It's never been completed. Here's another view of it. And you can notice if you're looking, if you look at the right side where the flattened part stops, there's a kind of radius, almost like uh, you can imagine like a huge belt sander was placed on this area. I mean, I'm sure that's not what it was. I don't know. I don't have any idea what kind of tool would be using to be used to do this, but it doesn't look like chisel work. And we're, we'll actually later on, we'll take a look at what chisel work looks like. It's very recognizable. Uh, and there are other stone working methods. And this just doesn't look like anything we would normally associate with ancient stone working techniques. Here's another couple of photos looking up. And again, I'm standing at the base of the pyramid, looking upwards at this flattened area. And you know, the, my, the top of my head comes to basically the top of the second layer. So I'm looking up the angle of the pyramid. And again, you can see the radius and how they really, they were just like, we need to flatten out a square of area right around the entrance right here. And it doesn't matter where the blocks start or end. They just wanted this square. And so there's, if you're looking on the right side of this, you can see the radius. And they were, were removing a lot of material. In other words, these blocks came from the quarry with a lot of extra material on them that was not going to be part of the finished product. That's really interesting for a lot of reasons. First of which is how much extra weight that is that means. You know, you're talking about removing hundreds, maybe thousands of pounds, I don't know of material from these blocks, which means that you're having to, all up to the point to where you finish it, you're having to carry this block around with all this extra weight on it. And so why would you do that? Well, one possibility is that it protects what you want uh, your finished surface to be. All of that extra material on the, on the front side of that block right there acts as a padding. So if something is dropped on it, or if the block itself is dropped during transport, or if it's been put in place on the pyramid and something is from above comes tumbling down, it hits that extra material and doesn't actually damage what you're gonna what you're gonna have the finished surface uh, will be because it's actually deep inside the stone. And this next picture, Kyle took this picture as an excellent uh, illustration of how much material they were removing from these blocks. So Kyle's leaning up against the flattened area, and that's our buddy Josh leaning up against the. Uh, the pillowy stone. So that shows you they're removing 12 inches, maybe 18 inches of granite in some cases on these blocks. That's a lot of rock. You know, go out and find a, go out and find yourself a piece of granite that's that thick, nice and big, and try to pick it up. <laughs> it's gonna, uh, some of that is going to be two feet. Yeah. I mean, look at his shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of material that they were removing. And again, you're asking, you're, Another question you ask is, well, how did they think they were going to do this? With what tools? Remember that in, at this period, 26th century BC, we're talking copper and stone tools. You know, copper stone tools with wooden handles or, uh, or possibly antler handles. You're not, what are they removing this granite with? One more thing to point out in this, uh, on this flattened area before we move on. And this is, this is another part of the pattern for these sites that have these, all of these different uh, similar attributes. And that is this area right here. So we'll zoom in on this real quick. And you can see it. This is, this is, you notice this in the tiny details that even though they were working with this very hard stone with enormous amounts of weight, 
they were willing to make these tiny deviations in the layering where they're basically dropping the whole layer right there, starting with this block down a half an inch, I don't know, an inch, a quarter of an inch, uh, so that they have to cut that matching uh, line in the block below it. And then they still fit it so perfectly. And keep in mind, again, that these blocks are fitted with that puffiness and then flattened out. And you can see how tight the joins are after the flattening is done. It's just absolutely amazing. I think this might be evidence as well that, that it's the same methodology going into flattening the sides, the, the mating faces of, yeah. these, of these stones, that they're doing something there too. Yes, I agree. Yeah. It, it seems like they're actually, the stones themselves have interacted with each other to make these yeah, joints. Yeah, to make those, th yeah. that, they, that they match so well. Right, exactly. And sometimes that big heavy block just kind of digs in. And, yeah, it digs but, in a little yeah, bit. You know, you'd think it would round that corner off, though. That would be the weakest part. So it's Right, like, and then you start wondering, what is it doing to the core block it's sitting on? Yeah. Because the core block should be close to the same. So is maybe the core block it's sitting on is down a little bit, so like they make the whole that. thing down a little bit? Or is it that... This thing is seated on the core block properly, and then the whole front of that block comes down a half an inch mm -hmm. so that they can seat it deeper into this block just to lock them in place. I don't it's know. Wild. Yeah, but it's a, yes. those are all good points. Yeah. Okay, so we've been looking at the north side of Minkara. Now we're going to go around to the east side, and you can see there's, a str there's another structure there, the square structure. That is the Pyramid Temple of Minkara or the Mortuary Temple of Minkara, and we'll look at that. But first... We're going to look at this area. There is another flattened area on this face of the pyramid. It's very interesting. And this one doesn't have an entrance associated with it. So when we were first talking about this, we we're like, well, maybe they were flattening it because it's the entrance and there's something special about the entrance. But no, there's a flattened side. There's a flattened square on this side of the pyramid as well. And the last time we were there, we actually circumnavigated the thing looking for flattened sides on the other two sides of the pyramid. But unfortunately, the other two sides haven't been cleared away of the rubble. So there's just piles of granite rubble leaning up against the body of the pyramid. So if there's flattened surfaces, they may be under the rubble. But we did find evidence in the form of uh, prism-shaped blocks. In other words, blocks that have been that have a, an angled face like this that have been obviously flattened out. So that may be evidence that those sides did have flattened spaces, but they've been mostly destroyed. The other thing to note here is this interesting block, kind of a reverse keystone. This may, this may just be how the builders work. I mean, you see the block above it, it's got this interesting angle. The one below it is kind of this parallelogram. So maybe this is nothing special, and this is just how they do their sort of, you know, every block is a different shape puzzle pieces, or maybe this is an indication that something interesting is going on structurally right here. Who knows? But then, the, so the question comes up, why would you flatten faces, flatten these square faces on each side of the pyramid, or at least on these two sides? Well, let's say that you're an ancient civilization and you want to build a giant triangle in the sand and you want it to have this very specific angle, 51 degrees, 20 minutes, 25 seconds. You're going to build the whole thing out of massive blocks of limestone, but that limestone is weak to the elements. You want it. You want this structure to last a long time, so you're going to co uh, case it in granite, kind of put a roof on it. So you start stacking up these granite blocks, and the blocks are being sent to you from the quarry with lots of lots of extra material on them. So you have so as as you start stacking the blocks, you're beginning to lose your <laughs> your eye on the angle that you want to maintain. So maybe while you're still close to the ground uh, and you have a level surface that you can work from, from and you got your the angle you want to maintain, that 50 degrees is right about here. So while you're still close to the ground and you can do some surveying, you set up some equipment and you check your angles and then you flatten a section of blocks to match that angle like this. And then you can keep stack, stacking up granite because now you have a surface you can check from all the way to the top of the pyramid. Maybe, this is just a guess, it's possible that there were other flattened surfaces up higher on this pyramid as well, other survey points. And all we see are these two that survive. But anyway, now that you have this flattened platform that you can work from, you can set up equipment there and you can check your lines, you can check, check the depth, you can make sure that each block you install sticks out far enough so that when you flatten the whole thing out, you have a nice, flattened, even surface 
to make your pyramid look good and protect the interior core uh, blocks. Okay, real quick, we'll take a look at the mortuary temple. This is built out of megalithic limestone, and you can see from the very degraded uh, look of the limestone blocks that this this temple has been sitting here a long time. It's It's been heavily eroded, and this is what you want to avoid with your pyramid. You know, it, just think, if this is only 4,000 years old, look how heavily eroded it is. And you don't want that to happen to your pyramid. Uh, so casing it in granite is a good idea. But the most interesting part about this particular structure is how it actually is connected to the pyramid itself. So if the idea that we're working with is that the pyramid builders were casing their pyramid in granite, and based on these flattened areas... And the fact that the other two pyramids had completely flat by reports with their, uh, all of their casing stones were flattened, that these pyramid builders also intended to flatten all of these granite casing stones, then it's really interesting that this mortuary temple, who is suppo it's, it's supposed to have been built as part of the same complex, all part of this pyramid. They build the pyramid and they build the temple at the same time, and yet... This temple butts up against the pyramid against the unfinished granite casing stones. So that's interesting. This could be an indication that the temple was built much later. That the pyramid builders came along, they built this enormous structure, they were adding the granite, and they were intending to flatten it. They didn't finish the job, and then somebody later came along and added this external temple and just tried to butt it up against these unfinished casing stones and they didn't it you know it was a difficult job and they didn't do a very good job at it as you can see from uh from these from this picture right here yeah and it's, you can see in other examples <clears throat> in egypt when they intended to make a 90 degree turn in a wall like they they uh would either be consistent with the stone you know this is just yes. weird to to make that transition yes to limestone at a corner like that it's, it's right. just unusual I it's think. it seems like if all of this was being built at once that the the limestone core masonry for the temple would go all the way to the limestone core, core masonry, masonry of the pyramid yes. and then they would case all, all of, of it in it. granite. So this is just very strange. Yeah. All right. Staying on the Giza plateau but moving over to the Valley Temple. <clears throat> this is another one where you basically have enormous megalithic limestone blocks making up the core masonry of this structure. And then the whole thing has been cased in granite. The interior casing still exists. And then there are also these, there are interesting, um, like sort of standalone granite pillars. These tall, you can see them in the back, back of this picture here. But these two walls that we're looking at in this doorway actually have limestone cores inside. <clears throat> but this structure looks like it's been mostly completed. The granite has been flattened. Uh, but it's, prob it's very probable that the granite was installed with the in the same way as what we were seeing over at Menkare, like the casing stones. It was puffy. It was pillowy. And then once they were done installing all the granite, they came along and they flattened out the entire thing. And this, uh, this temple is it's, it's just, just beautiful to walk through. Here's another good view of it. And it's got some really enormous blocks in it, like this one off to the right here. Uh, and this one is... You know, there's a doorway there, so it kind of makes sense. But this is like an Osirian size block <laughs> that's on the side here. Uh, and there's another one on this side. <clears throat> and this block shows another interesting feature that's part of the pattern that we'll recognize as we go through these sites. And that is that this block goes around the corner in the back there. So let's zoom in and get a closer look at it. Here's the corner. And here's the block. And as you can see, the block goes around that corner. Here's another corner. Note that the corner has a, it's somewhat difficult to see in the photos, but when you're there, it's very clear that each corner has a continuous defined line going all the way down from the top of the wall, all the way to the floor that has a, has a, has a particular radius. It's like a tool mark line almost. Yes, it does look like a tool mark line. But here we go. This is the corner. And then this block goes around the corner. This block goes around the corner. And the one below it also goes around the corner. 
And then this one on the left goes around the corner. And here's another corner. This is a pretty good view of that corner line, a tool mark that goes all the way down. And it has a radius, as you can see. It's not a perfect 90 degree. It actually has a curve to it, like some kind of tool made it all the way down. But again, here's the corner line. And the block on the right goes around the corner. And the block on the left above it goes around the corner. And the block above it on the right goes around the corner. And on and on and so forth. And sometimes it alternates perfectly like that, back and forth. Not always. And just in case you're in doubt, <laughs> there's this block that like is the corner. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, I just wonder, was this block L-shaped? Or did they install it like that and cut out all that material? They were just like, we don't have any good corner blocks for this. Uh, just put this one in there and we'll cut the whole thing. We'll cut half of the block out of there. Yeah, and how far back does it go? I mean, it could be a, a giant square-shaped block and it's just the, that corner notch. Yeah, right, just a yeah. notch taking out of the corner. But it's this enormous thing sitting in the wall. Yeah. So how are they achieving this effect? This is something we've gone back and forth on. We've done a lot of we've, – we've thought about this a lot and we have – I think we've got we've we've got the idea. So let's say this is a top-down view. You want to build a chamber like we've been looking at with the Valley Temple here. So you've got this long rectangular chamber. Where this is a top-down view. You install your massive limestone core masonry, and then you want to case the interior in granite. So you install the granite blocks, and they have the you know they all fit very well against each other, but they have this sort of puffy, you know, unfinished look to the interior side. And also note, when you're looking at this, none of these granite blocks are going around any corners. They're just sitting up against each other. But here's the actual interior dimensions of this chamber that you want. So you go up on top of the wall and you drill four holes at the corners you want. And then you go down in there with your magic granite scraping removal tool and you flatten out all these blocks all the way to those corner holes that you've drilled. And it looks like this. And then you have four blocks that go around corners now because you've removed all that extra material. So I think this is a pretty good theory on how this was how this effect was achieved. Okay, one more thing to look at before we move on from the Valley Temple is the fineness of the joins. So that's what this picture is illustrating. I've got my hand there. It's right beneath a horizontal join and a vertical join that's meeting it. And I'll just draw some lines here to show you where they are because they're really hard to see. So there's the horizontal and the vertical join. Remove the lines and you can see how, I mean, it's there, but they're almost invisible. That's how, and these, so these massive megalithic blocks weighing many, many tons, sometimes tens, some of them possibly up to a hundred tons. And these joins are almost invisible. Here's another one, an outside corner. The blocks are joined together so well that in this case, you can only see it because there's a slight sort of indentation where the join is. And if you're looking really closely, you can see it because of the discontinuity in the crystalline structure of the granite. But it's almost impossible to see an actual line. And I wonder if that feature, that, that sort of uh, dip where it goes to the corner is is because of age. It could be age, like, yeah. Because that corner actually each was sharp. Yeah, yeah, they're sharp. They could have been sharp, and yeah. and that because of the discontinuity in the crystalline structure, it's a weak point. It's a weak point. So it wears more. It than, wears away. Yes, and so you end up with this slight indentation all the way down the line. Yeah, and you can see how heavily eroded this granite. This is this granite is decomposing. That's how that's how long it's been sitting there. Okay. So we were up at the Pyramid of Menkara there. You can see it at the north end of the Nile. And we're going to go 300 miles south, upriver, to the Osirian. This is a top-down view of the Osirian. Next to it and above it is the Temple of Seti I. The temple is beautiful. It's above ground. It's clearly dynastic work. But right here next to it, and 30 to 40 feet below ground surface, it's down so far it's actually sitting in the water table, is the Osirian itself. And the Osirian looks very different from normal dynastic work. So here's a view of the Osirian. We're walking around the upper part of it. We're on the ground level looking down into it. And here's another view. And see, notice in the back there, the cliff, the sort of, uh, that's all the sediment 
that would be that either this structure has been dug down into or somebody dug it out of. It's not clear which one it is. Uh, and you can also see that there's water sitting in the uh, in some of the the pits in the structure itself. And we know there's at least one more um, there's one more uh, uh, level below this. So that's another question about the Osirian is if this was built by ancient builders, how did they construct it into the water table? How did they keep the water out of their uh, out of the hole while they were building this stuff? I would just like to point out the the block directly beneath or you know to the towards the bottom of the picture from that big square nice square hole with the water in it uh -huh. that was one block and they cut that giant oh part yeah of you're the right square the, the, the floor tile yes the floor tile Sorry. yes yes there's a floor tile there with most of the middle of it completely cut out to make that hole in the in the in yeah. the floor yeah and well and actually it, it has some very interesting features to it as well that I I have some pictures of it's just it's Incredible what they did. Okay, and I'm sorry yes. to sidetrack. No, it's not a sidetrack. We'll also be taking a closer look at that that square pit right there that's cut into that floor tile as well. Here's another view when we're down inside the Osirian. As you can see, most many I don't know if it's most many of the columns are single pieces. The one all the way on the left here is two pieces, and then there's another one past the big single piece that has a secondary piece up at the top. But most of these are just one giant column and then the cross beams going across the tops of them you know it's just one it's like a huge block going across the top one per span and then across that in the other direction were the ceiling blocks which there aren't very many of those left i love this picture this shows you the enormity of these columns they're absolutely gigantic it's difficult to express like when you're standing in here the the the, the sheer size and I don't know, the weight of these things is palpable. You can feel it when you're looking at them and walking around them. The other thing about being in the Osirian is it isn't temple-like. It's more like walking around in the basement of a skyscraper. It looks like foundations. That's what it seems like to me. It's just everything is huge, and it seems like it's meant to hold up the world. You know, it's got nothing on top of it. So it's like you're walking around in the ruins of, a found, of the foundation of a very large or tall building that no longer exists. And that the building had down in the in the basement, that's where you've got all the all the machinery, you know, you've got all the the maintenance materials for the building itself. And that it, it is strange because as you can see, there's not a lot of room to walk around this block without falling down into the uh into this channel. And the channel is deep, you know, it's full of water now, but if if you stepped down if it didn't have any water in it, you can't just step down into it. It's a, it's quite a drop. So it's just really strange walking around in here. It doesn't seem like it was designed for people to, to come into it like a temple normally is. Here's another view, one of the giant blocks, just trying to show you the size of this. But we'll also, let's take a real quick look at a comparison to what a dynastic temple looks like. The dynastic temples are also massive, but they're open and airy, and every surface is covered in writing or drawings or pictures, uh, sculptures. You know, every surface is talking to you. They're all decorated. Whereas in the Assyrian and some and most of the places, the structures we're looking at, it's there's no decoration. There's no carvings, unless they were put there by later people. There's no original carvings, no original decorations. It just doesn't look like the same construction mindset. All right, we're going to take a closer look at the bottom of this block, but. First, I want you to note that dotted line going down on the upper right of this block. We're going to see more marks like this, but this is, an, this is evidence of ancient quarrying. Somebody was trying to steal granite from this site, uh, and they're trying to basically break it off of this block, and they didn't really succeed on this one. But we'll see more of this and discuss it more later. But let's look at the bottom of this block and how, notice how it's kind of sitting down in an indentation, like it's sort of countersunk into the floor tiles. And I'll draw a line around it real quick so you can see what I'm talking about. There's a, there's definitely a, the block is sitting in a, in a platform that's built for the block that's an inch or two deeper than the floor surface itself. This block that we saw before is also sitting in one. Here's a closer look at the bottom. You can see that it's sitting in its own kind of countersunk square. 
And this area that we were talking about earlier, where most of this big floor tile has been cut away to make room for this hole, this hole is also surrounded by a slight indentation, indicating that there probably used to be a giant column here. But this big square pit here gives a good indication about what may be actually happening in the interface between the columns and the floor tiles. So instead of something simple like this, where you have the floor and you have your column, and you just set the column down on the floor. Instead, it may be something much more interesting, like this. Where the block is actually socketed into the floor. So again, you start to ask, why? Why were they building with, I mean, that block, once you put it there, it's not going to move, <laughs> right? What's going to move that block? And yet they, they seem to have been building for the ages. Like they're socketing this block in. They want it to stay in that spot. It's just very interesting. And again, again, it gives you an insight into the minds of the builders. So here's another look down. You can see the channel. Again, note how strange it is to move around in here. There's all these little alcoves on the right, on the outer wall there. But you have to cross this huge channel. There's no good way to get across it. You basically have to go into the back there and, and walk across. They've got some boards laying across or you crawl across some rubble. And if you're trying to squeeze past the columns, you don't want to fall in the water. It's very it's just strange to move around in here. But I'm actually standing where, where I'm taking this picture from. I'm standing below three of the only remaining ceiling tiles, which you can see here. I look up and take a picture. There's three of them there. And that's the pattern on the tiles is the reflection from the water in the channel there. And again, these ceiling tiles are absolutely gigantic. Uh, I'm going to be using that word a lot. They're enormous. And when you're standing below them, again, you can it's like you can feel the weight of them above you. It's, it, it's, it's a very strange sensation. So let's take a look a bit at some of the features of some of the outer walls. You may start to recognize some of the patterns we've been looking at. Here's a couple of nubs, very slightly uh, visible, like they've almost been completely removed, but they were definitely there. And this section of the wall has a bunch of interesting features. First, here's a couple of nubs here. And we also have this indentation, reverse nub, similar to what we saw over at the Menkara Pyramid. Were these for maneuvering the blocks? I don't know, but it looks like they did have some kind of purpose for sure. Then there's also these little tiny inserts. And you see this is another detail that you see in a lot of the construction that has this particular style, along with the other patterns of nubs and indentations and scoop marks and other things like that. That there are these little bitty inserts where they seem to have been maybe correcting a slight error or possibly just filling a hole because of some damage to a block or whatever, but they have these tiny inserts. And in some cases, when the walls have been completely finished and the puffiness or pillowiness of the walls have been removed and is flattened out, you can see the inserts are just beautifully fitted in, just like the, the rest of the blocks. And then there's also the angle change in the layer here. And this is interesting because it happens above and below this small central block here. Like there, again, is possibly something structural going on here that's interesting that we can only get a hint of by this interesting angle change above and below in this central block. Another view of the one of the outer walls. This one has lots of the same things that we notice in the pattern. Nubs all over the place. There's a few I've circled. There's also a couple of scoop marks up here. And if you look closely at this picture, you'll see there's lots of vertical uh, marks that may be some kind of tool mark. These are just very clear, so I've circled them. But all over this wall, you see these vertical lines that kind of look like scoops or scoop marks uh, that where somebody was using some kind of tool to remove material in a rough way. There's also something right here that I actually found while working on this presentation. Uh, that's really interesting, and this is definitely something I want to check when we go back to Egypt. I'll zoom in here. It's right here. We'll zoom in one more time. <laughs> and there you can see it. It looks like this block has a tiny, tiny sliver of itself sitting beneath the adjacent block on the left. And if that is the case, and we actually, we went through a bunch of Kyle's photos and found another one where it... it 
at first I was like, maybe this is an artifact of this picture, but no, Kyle has a picture where it's visible in that too from a slightly different angle. It doesn't seem like an artifact of this picture. So we definitely need to check this out because this is amazing. <laughs> this is absolutely amazing. Yeah. It represents, it, it seems to me like it represents an angle ch- or, or a, a, a level change in the layering that they achieved by having that tiny piece of this block sit beneath the one above it. Like well, they... <laughs> they yeah. they wanted the, the the level change to happen not in the join. Yeah, and to me, this also <laughs> represents that 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 they were finishing these mating faces of these stones while they were on the wall. Yeah. So they 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 when they stacked this block you have in blue, it had all of that material on the left, and they flattened it against the block beneath it. Then when they put the block on the left in there. Uh, they ground away because yeah. you, you you can't imagine they left that tiny little sliver on purpose on yeah, the ground and then kicked it up and <laughs> yeah, exactly it would it would break off. So I yes. think I think that could be evidence that they're they're literally finishing these surfaces while they're on the wall. Yeah, like, which is wild. That is wild. Yeah. So we definitely need to check this when we go back to Egypt. And here's one more look at this outer wall. Uh, again, you can see so many of the of the marks that we are now recognizing as patterns. There's there's nubs, there's vertical scoops, uh, there's angle changes, the heterogeneous nature of the blocks themselves, uh, the level changes in the layering. But here's a, a set of clearly visible scoops. We'll we'll zoom in on the top on this on the top of this block over here. There's four very obvious looking tool marks of some kind, or sets of tool marks. I don't know. Are they, is that four individual tool marks or is that a pattern made by a specific kind of tool that looks like four marks? But it does seem to indicate that they were intending to flatten this wall, that they were coming along and they were going to remove material to get, to actually make this wall nice and flat and polished, similar to what we saw in the Valley Temple but they didn't complete the job. And we actually know that that's what they were intending to do because there's a whole section of flattened wall underneath those giant ceiling blocks that we were talking about a little while ago. And you can see, again, somebody was coming along with some kind of tool and flattening this wall, removing several inches of material. So if they had continued this job, all the nubs would be gone. All of the, the scoop marks that we see, all the indentations, all of these interesting marks, all that stuff would be completely gone. It was not intended to be part of the finished product. The finished product was going to be a beautifully flattened, tightly joined, heterogeneous wall uh, that maybe would have even had a polished surface. So imagine somebody, you know, this is this is very similar looking to what you see if somebody's coming along and painting the interior of a room with a roller, a paint roller. The way the marks are ending at the bottom of the flattened section looks a lot like they were using a tool that had, a, a, you know, it had a particular width. And as they went down, they removed the tool from the wall. They go back up the top. They start removing material. They get down to the bottom. They remove the tool, and it leaves these these curved marks and also those tiny little wedges that are going upwards. Here's another view of it from underneath the ceiling tiles, looking outwards, where these marks are extremely clear. You can see how it's, it, it's the tool. It looks like, I'm not sure this is exactly what was happening, but it looks like the tool is being removed from the work face right there and leaving this sort of ramp. And here's another view of it. And the reason I want to show you this picture is because this has another interesting feature, which is part of the pattern. It's back here in the corner. So we'll take a closer look at this and you can see that we have a block that goes around the corner. Here's the corner line, and here's the block. So this is evidence for the method that we talked about earlier where I showed the diagram. This block did not used to go around the corner. It used to have excess material on it, but somebody came along with a flattening tool and removed material all the way back to the corner that they wanted, and that left this block going around the corner. Okay. So now we're going another 200 miles upriver down south from the Osirian to the quarry at Aswan. This is the source of a lot of this granite. Not all of it. There are multiple, were multiple granite quarries, but this is where they got a lot of granite. Uh, And this is a huge site. Here's the quarry itself. It's this massive outcrop of granite. 
And one of the reasons this quarry is famous is because of this thing that you can kind of see in this picture. This is the unfinished obelisk. So we'll be taking a look at that as well. But first, let's take a look at some known stone working marks in the quarry itself. These are chisel marks. And these are actually a very interesting kind of chisel marks called comb chiseling, where somebody went to sort of, you know, they took pains to make sure that every chisel mark was sort of parallel to the one before it, kind of kind of gives this, this combed look. That's actually something you usually associate with finished work. It has a particular kind of look. Um, so it's interesting that it's in here in the quarry still attached to the rock. Uh, but as you can see, I got a couple of pictures here of, of Roman quarrying from other from other areas, and you can see that chisel marks don't have to be parallel. They can, you know, they're just if you're all you're trying to do is remove material, you just do it in any direction you you can or you want or that's convenient. But these are comb chisel marks in the quarry. Here's another section where somebody was quarrying stone out of there, and this has recognizable quarry marks as well. They're here, all these dotted lines. Remember the dotted lines we saw, the dashed line we saw in the uh, in the column in the Osirian? These are similar marks using the same kind of technique that uses tools that look like this. This is called uh, feather and wedge quarrying, where you use these tools, you drill a bunch of holes or you make holes in the stone, and then you drive these tools into the holes in a line or in a row. And you, continue, you keep driving the tools in and then it applies pressure and splits the rock along the axis of the line itself. And then you end up with broken stone with tool marks that look like this, which is, these are modern marks, obviously, but in ancient times they used the same technique and they would use wedges or sometimes, I mean, sometimes you read that they used wooden wedges and they poured water on them to split stone. I would like to see somebody do that with granite. Um, but... In any case, you have to make the holes in the granite first, and that requires, you can't do that with copper. You need iron at the very least. So this was, these marks that we were looking at in the quarry could have been made by uh, the Greeks or the Romans possibly, you know, somebody who had harder metals than just copper, because you've got to be able to make those deep dashed marks in the granite in the first place to get this technique to work. Then you have marks like this in the quarry. These don't match any known quarrying techniques. No chiseling, no feather and wedge here. Something else is happening. And these are all over the place uh, in the quarry itself. The other thing um, you had mentioned before is that that feather and wedge technique will not produce a pillowy You're surface. You're right. Yes. You're right. I need to remember because that. Because that's a, that's a convex yeah. surface, which... Yes. Feather and wedge will not produce blocks with, with nubs, <laughs> <laughs> or pillowy blocks. It, especially when you're doing it in granite. It splits the granite and you, you end up with a, a rough but flattened yeah. face. I mean, it, it may be con a little bit convex on one side, a little bit concave, concave on, on the, the other. other. Yeah. But they're consistently pillowy. Yeah. Right. On right. The yeah. With lots of extra material yes. that bulges outwards. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Here's more of these strange scoop marks in the quarry. This is actually, I'm looking down. These actually step down, and these are very wide. I don't know, what would you say, 12, 18 inches? Uh, yeah, 18 inches. Probably. Yeah, and they're, it's very regular. Each one is the same width going down. Here's now, so I'm now at the bottom of that same set of scoop marks looking upwards, and you can, you can see the kind of stair step, but I don't know, so almost an organic pattern. It does look like somebody was just able to scoop material out of this very hard stone. I don't think that's what was happening. Maybe it was, but that is what it looks like. And again, it doesn't match known. There's no chisel marks here. There's no feather and wedge marks here. This is something else. Here's another set. Notice in the foreground, actually lower right right there, that's a set of feather and wedge marks, yeah. right? And somebody split the rock away above that, uh, uh, to the right of those marks. But down here below it, this is something else. And notice, again, notice on this one, there's this interesting ha thing happening from the upper right to the lower left, there's a slow and consistent angle change in the direction of each mark. And this makes you start to think of the, like a tool with a, with a, a center somewhere in an articulating arm where it's reaching out and cutting and reaching out and cutting again. And each time it's turning a little bit and reaching a little farther and cutting a different at a different angle each time. 
Also notice the shoe, the footprint down there. I mean, that gives you a little bit of scale too. Oh, what the guy's shoes? The footprint in the bottom of that. Oh yes, yeah. I see <laughs> the footprint in the bottom of that. Yes, yeah, they're very right. deep. Yes, they're deep. Yeah. Here's another set of these strange scoop-like marks, and you can see that these, if you say they're starting at the bottom here, you can see that they go all the way up the wall. Each one is a continuous line going up the wall. It's kind of faint in this picture, but I think you can still see it. That each scoop that we can clearly see defined at the bottom on the grayer rock actually goes all the way up the wall in a continuous line. And then we come to this object, the unfinished obelisk. This thing is 137 feet or 41.75 meters. It, would, it weighs an estimated 1,200 tons, although no one really knows because it's still attached to the bedrock. But I guess they've done some assumptions on how big it would have been if they would have continued digging it out, and it would they would estimated that it would have weighed 1,200 tons. That's 2.4 million pounds or 1.09 million kilograms. An absolutely enormous object, as you can see from the scale of people standing up in the back there and in the foreground. And also notice all the interesting marks on it and around it, which we'll take a look at a little, in a little bit here. Here's another view of it, just trying to show you the scale. See the people all the way in the back, all the, all the way up there in the upper right? They're standing at the, at the top of it, looking at it. So that shows you how just absolutely gigantic this thing is. And for comparison, the largest standing obelisk that Egypt ever erected still exists. It's in Rome today, uh, and it's actually a lot smaller than it used to be because it's been broken a couple of times. But originally, it was 105 feet or 32 meters tall, and only weighed 455 tons compared to this 1,200-ton monster that we're looking at that's still in the quarry here. And we know they were actually making an obelisk, or we're pretty sure, because it's obelisky. They were making the top of it pointed, and the whole thing has this gentle taper, right? It gets wider and wider as you go towards the bottom. And again, notice all the interesting marks. Where the, these are part of the pattern. And you can see them here. And notice the deep trenches. And this is a great view. This is one of my favorite pictures I've taken of this thing. Standing way up above it, trying to get the whole thing in the view. But again, you see these marks. They have this sort of interesting grid pattern. They're on the sides of the trenches. They're on the top of the obelisk itself. And they're down in the trenches themselves. We'll zoom in. We can see it a little easier. Even though you, you can really clearly see on the obelisk, there's a couple of places where there's deep marks. There's actually these, these scoops are actually all over these square-ish scoop marks are all over the entire thing in a, in a sort of a rough grid, like, like if you tossed a net over the whole thing. The net doesn't make a perfect grid, you know, because it's kind of wavy. It lands weird, but it, it does form a grid. And you can see that the scoop marks on the bottom of the trenches are continuous. They go up. There's obvious, uh, like each one is an obvious line going up from the bottom of the trench and also across the top of the, of the trench here and down into the trench. And I think it's probably likely, uh, you'd have to get a detailed scan of the entire object to find this out for sure, but I think it's likely that it goes, these lines go all the way down to the bottom of the trench, across the bottom of the trench, up the side of the obelisk, across the top of the obelisk, down the other side of the obelisk, across the bottom of the trench, and up the other side. Both ways, vertically and horizontally on the obelisk itself. Making a rough grid over the entire thing. It would be great to get a detailed scan to actually try to confirm that. But again, you start to ask, this is not chiseling. This doesn't look like chiseling. This is definitely not feather and wedge. Something else was happening here. And what's great is <laughs> when you go to this site, when you first get there, before they even let you in to look at the quarry that itself, they, they, I think they know you're going to be asking questions about these weird scoop marks. So they show you this video with Zahi Hawass where he's <laughs> saying that the way this was done, <laughs> Kyle is attempting it right here. He's trying to make his very own scoop mark. <laughs> so they say they had these dolerite pounding stones, these green, it's a green stone. It's a little bit harder than granite. They're like cantaloupe sized. Uh, and basically the idea is, is that 
a worker would come in and he'd get his pounding stone and he would get in the trench of the obelisk and he would just pound away at the granite, making dust uh, all day. And that's how they were digging this thing out of the granite. I can't quite buy this story. But it's an entertaining video to watch, nonetheless. And it's fun to watch people when we go here to watch them try it. And then they, they pound away at the thing and then they put it down and they're like, no. Nope. <laughs> it doesn't take long. No, it doesn't take long before you decide, no. This is not how it was done. So they don't let us, unfortunately, get down into the trenches alongside the obelisk. You can't, they wouldn't let us stand on top of it. They wouldn't let us climb in the trenches. But there are a couple of places elsewhere in the quarry where somebody was also cutting away enormous pieces of stone. It's not clear what they were going to be. Maybe statues, maybe something else. But the uh, they were using the same techniques because there's obvious scoop marks here. I'm, I've got a good picture of them from one angle. This is a picture of the same marks from a different angle. This shows you, this is really, I love this picture. It shows you the same stair step that each scoop has a basically, it's, it's got a similar width to the ones to either, either side of it. Like the tool was very similar. And also if you look closely, you can see that the scoops continue down the wall, going down into the trench. And that also there's angle changes as it goes down into the trench on some of these marks. Here's another view. Well, where you can see we're climbing around in this trench. The, the trench wall is to the left. The stone that they were, the, the work stone, the, the thing that they wanted is to the right. But you can see the scoops start at the top of the wall there, and they go all the way down the wall into the trench, across the bottom of the trench. Here's another view of that wall where you can see the, the continuous line of these tool marks. And then here's the bottom of the trench looking up underneath. This is the, so to above us here, to the left and above is the work stone, the thing they were attempting to dig out. This is the block or statue, whatever it was going to be that they were removing from the quarry. And you can see the scoop marks go across the bottom of the trench, up onto the worked block and continue up and over it. Here's another view of it. This is a good view because it shows you how, like Kyle was saying with the footprints earlier, how deep these scoops are. This is not a trivial depth. And if you were actually doing this with chisels or... Pounding stones, why are they leaving these giant ridges when that would be actually the easiest material to remove if you're using a normal known tool type to cut this stone? That's where you would want to work at. That's the weakest spot. You would hit that with your pounding stone and hopefully break away a big chunk instead of just making dust all day. But yet we see these constant, these trenches. And also there's, if you look on the right, you can see how there's several continuous lines of what look like angle changes in the directions of the scoops themselves, which may indicate a, what, what was happening. Again, you start to think of a tool with a common sender and a long articulating arm that's reaching down in here and digging. Like think of backhoe, but way more complicated that can do it to granite instead of dirt. However, that might work. Okay. So from the quarry, we're going to go all the way back up the Nile, down the Nile, to the north, to the Serapium, and take a look at this site. The Serapium is actually absolutely amazing. It used to be, it used to have a large above ground complex, but now everything we see here is basically the underground galleries. Um, this is a great map. This is the only one I could find that was horizontal. So thanks to Gregor for making this beautiful map. <laughs> uh, it's this this uh, this underground complex is called the the Greater Galleries. This is what remains that there, le there were lesser galleries and a whole bunch of other tunnels. They all collapsed or filled in or they're too dangerous now. But you can go here as a tourist and get into the greater galleries. There's 24 boxes, each one set in its own alcove. And they are beautiful objects. And they're absolutely enormous. And they do show many of the patterns of the other sites we've been looking at. You can see here our buddy Yusuf. Uh, standing next to one. This is showing you, this is to show you the scale. Again, these boxes are gigantic. Some of these lids weigh from 10, 20, possibly up to 30 tons. The boxes themselves, maybe 40 up to 70 tons. So in total from 70 tons with the lid to 100 tons with the lid, possibly as some of the bigger ones. Uh, and they're made out of a kind of granite called diorite, a dark granite, beautiful. And they've been cut and polished 
to perfection. They have almost a mirror shine. But unfortunately, everything down in here is very dusty, so you can't usually see uh, how reflective they are. But there's just one after the other of these beautiful objects, each sitting in their own particular alcove. And you can see that the, the builders were not totally concerned on consistency in terms of sizes. You'll see, you'll notice as we go through these that the lids are different heights uh, or different thicknesses, um, but they all have this general prism shape. Look at this one. And some of them have big scoop marks taken out, like they were removing material for some reason after shaping the bo the, the, the lid or the box itself. For some reason, they decided to remove an enormous amount of material, like you could see on the right side of this lid here. Somebody cut a big chunk out of it out of there, and then they polished it. That removal area is polished. Here's another one. You can see the lid is taller than the last one we were looking at, and it has scoops taken out of the top. This lid is much flatter than the one we just looked at, and it has scoops taken out of the right side that you can see there. This lid has a bunch of scoops taken out of it. And this one, and again, these scoops are, it's like they somebody removed material and then polished the indentations. Here's another picture of that same lid, and you can see that there's deep scoop marks on the side as well as the top. And those like parallel lines going down the, uh, yes. the side there. And it looks like, I can't tell if this is an artifact of the photograph, but it looks like that angled side on the left there may actually have a slight convex mm -hmm. shape uh shape you can definitely Con see that the top is is has a lip concave concave yeah. you're right yeah i yeah. think so yeah so again this is not something you expect to see this the that lip on that upper edge there if it is there if there is one based on the shadows is very fine you know and again note the the sharp lines on these Here's another picture that's both showing you the scale of the lids and also scoop marks taken out of the forward the forward edge of this box that Kyle's touching right there. It's showing, and he's, I think, what are you doing? Feeling for the polish? You checking yes, to yeah, see if it's yeah. polished? Checking yeah? the polish. Yeah, checking the polish on the lid. Here's another one, a giant scoop taken out of the right side there and then polished. Another picture of another box. There's just so many of them. They're so beautiful. And this one almost looks perfect, except for some damage, but... All the way in the back, you'll notice on the right side, somebody took a big chunk of the corner out back there. This lid, the, they cut a lot of the front upper corner of this entire lid off of there and then polished it, as you can see from the reflection. Another picture that gives you scale. So even though the people down there are standing on a constructed floor that sits above the floor that the box is sitting on, the box is so tall that you can still walk underneath the lid. That kind of gives you an idea of how, how big these objects are. Here's Kyle standing on one of the boxes. And it's totally legal. <laughs> Definitely not illegal at all. This also gives you a picture of scale. Kyle's not doing any illegal science right now <laughs> down inside the box. So that shows you how the scale of the interior. A perfectly legal picture. And what's interesting is all of these boxes are deep down in these tunnels. You know, one of the questions is, is how are they moving these enormous objects into this area? And some people say, well, maybe you put the boxes in and then you build the structure over it. But that you can't do that here because this is actually, these tunnels are cut into the bedrock. So there's no, there's no putting the boxes in and then, you know, putting the bedrock back on top. And as you can see, the job of moving the boxes in and finishing them is not complete. This box still sits in one of the tunnels, and as you can see, there's not a whole lot of room to maneuver here. There's Kyle giving you scale. And again, we're standing on a floor that's built up above the floor that the box itself is sitting on. And he's still not as tall as the box itself. So if the lid was sitting on this box, he could easily walk underneath it without having to duck. These, these things are huge. And notice that this box is a little wonky, right? It is unfinished. It's... It's, I wouldn't say it's puffy, but it does have similar aspects to lots of the other unfinished blocks we've seen in place at Minkara, at the Osirian, where you know that these people were moving, they were still moving this box around, so it still has protective material on it. 
they're going to move the box into place and then they're going to shape it and it's going to get its final beautiful square form. They're going to put its prism lid on top of it and they're going to polish the whole thing in place. So what were they doing that with? What tools were they using to move these things around in these tunnels and also to do the finishing work in the tunnels? And real quick, a couple of pictures that show you the polish, but also the method that they use to date these boxes. There's a couple of them that have writing on them. This one is one of the ones you can go down and see. It's got these scratchings on it. But these, these carvings are actually, they're sort of roughly cut through the polish on the exterior of the box. As you can see from this picture, the lines aren't straight. And remember, this is very hard stone. So possibly this, it looks to me like somebody was in here and they did have like a copper chisel or maybe even an iron one. And their job was to draw some hieroglyphs onto this box and it was very difficult for them to do it. The quality of the glyphs and the drawings on here do not match the quality of the object itself. As you can see here, there's a close up. He couldn't even make the, the line connect here. You know, Yusuf kind of tells this funny story of how he imagines like each day the guy's getting more and more frustrated. And by the end <laughs> of the day, he's just like, ah, <laughs> he goes home and then he comes back the next day and then his line is much straighter and better. <laughs> and then as he goes along, it gets worse and worse and worse until he finally quits again, you know, so you can kind of see the progression of this poor guy. And again, you can tell that the, the glyphs have been roughly hewn through the polish of the box itself. Okay, so a quick trip around the world, well, to a few sites around the world. This is in Peru. So now that we've gone through all these Egypt things, hopefully you'll start to recognize the patterns that we've been looking at in these places around the world. This place is not complete. It is unfinished. This is at Ollante Tambo in, in Peru. This is the Temple of the Sun, or at least that's what it's called now. But you'll see vertical scoop marks, strange nubs, heterogeneous style, absolutely enormous blocks fitted in with tiny, or not, these aren't, quite so tiny, but closely fitted with these beautiful, like, uh, inserts in between all the nubs all over the place. And also this is andesite, which is a very, very hard kind of stone. More at Ollante Tambo, giant nubs, huge blocks, everything, it seems like everything was in motion. Like they were, these people were in the process of moving these blocks into place. And then you can see on the left there, this block that has one long, interesting nub on it is very beautifully fitted to the two below it. Yeah, and that long, interesting nub is very difficult to make. That yeah. That is really That's hard not, to do. Yeah, none of these nubs are easy to make, no, but you're I'm right. Just, these are actually beautifully formed nubs. Yeah. <laughs> nice, flat, long lines. Yeah. Here's another site in Peru. Again, you see the heterogeneous nature and... and in Peru, they, they go even more heterogeneous than what we were seeing in Egypt, where in Egypt, they tended to follow uh, similar layer or horizontal lines, but in Peru, they just com almost completely abandoned the horizontal line altogether. But again, you'll notice around the entrance back there where the people are gathered, the blocks get larger and there's a bunch of nubs around that section, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Saxewaman in Peru. Again, gigantic blocks. Interesting vertical scoop marks all over them, indentations everywhere. Hopefully you're beginning to see the patterns pillowy here. Surfaces. Yes, pillowy surfaces. I wonder if they were intending to flatten this and they never got around to it. This is another picture from uh, Saxewaman. Notice the two indentations at the bottom of the giant block on the left of it, the giant central block there, the 12-sided one. Uh, and then there's vertical and horizontal lines all over these. Again, heterogeneous. They're pillowy. And the whole thing seems to be incomplete. Easter Island, giant projects still in the quarry. This would have been the most enormous Moai ever constructed if it would have been completed. So this is another similar pattern in with the unfinished obelisk. You have giant, like you have these objects around the country or around the area. And then there's one still in the quarry that is absolutely enormous that would have been way bigger than all the rest of them, but it's still in there. Like whoever was building all of these things were like, okay, let's really go all out and do this giant project. And then for some reason, work stopped and they never came back to it. Another interesting thing about this, somewhat similar to the obelisk that we saw in Egypt, 
that they were already making obelisky while it was still attached to the quarry rock. This thing has already got a face on it. Like they were already carving it into a moai. It's already getting moai. Yeah, it's already moai. <laughs> Baalbek. This is the quarry at Baalbek. Again, we have, this is the, for a long time, the block on the top there was considered to be the largest cut and finished block that's ever been made. It's called the Stone of the South or the Stone of the Pregnant Woman. And then some German archaeologists went in there and started digging around it, and they found two even larger blocks below it. Like, it's stacked on top of these two even larger blocks. This picture gives you the scale. Who thought they were going to move these things? Well, somebody clearly could because they stacked that block on top on top of these two big ones. <laughs> this is in China. This is the Yangshan Quarry. I don't know a whole lot about this site. I would love to go here to see it, but it seem, the reason I'm showing it is it seems to have similar patterns. There's a story about it that it was going to be a giant monument and then it was incomplete. And it's incomplete because they realized that all this stuff was way too big to move. It is an interesting story. But if you look at this, it looks more like a rock cut temple than it does anything else. Like it it looks like somebody was actually finishing their work here because the the lines are all very clean. You know, it's definitely connected to the ground, but it's squarely connected to the ground. It doesn't look like somebody got to a point where like, you know what, this is going to be way too hard to pick up. It looks like they intended to leave it this way. This thing would have been part of it. If the story is correct, and this gives you the scale of this thing, I mean, who was going to move that? But yet, even so, in this picture, you can see vertical lines somewhat on the edge of this block going up and down. And then there's nubs all over this. And this, this is still attached to the bedrock, so that raises some interesting questions about nubs themselves. Like, are they for maneuvering something when it's still attached to the bedrock? I don't know. I would really love to go here. I would love to see if there's chisel marks on this, if there are recognizable patterns, but I haven't been able to find pictures that show closely enough. But again, I just got a bunch of these photos because this is a fascinating place and everything here is really big. And then in Japan, they also have megaliths that have strange vertical marks on them that are in grid patterns. These are actually, these kind of like reverse scoops. I'm not really sure what to think about these marks, but Japan also has absolutely enormous megaliths that are very interesting built into uh, walls like this. These are ancient megalithic walls in Japan, and you can kind of recognize the pattern here. This one looks like it was finished, though. Like somebody came, they, whoever did this job completed it. It's also interesting because these are ancient, and this is a place that has a lot of earthquakes, but it's like the way that they did the corners and they tilted all the walls inwards towards the top of the platform. You can imagine if an earthquake comes, this whole thing will shake, but it's got... It's got like an internal structural integrity, clearly, because the, the walls still exist. Even though it knocks down, the earthquakes knock down modern buildings, all of these ancient platforms are still here. They've, they've withstood hundreds, of thousands, hundreds or thousands of years of earthquakes. So, all over the world we see this, this these patterns, puffy blocks, nubs, people in the process of flattening things or polishing things, moving things around. They have these tiny details in them, like changing the layers, altering the, the layer a quarter of an inch when they're using giant megalithic blocks. Blocks go around corners or they're, they're, they're constructing things with massive megaliths of softer stone and then casing it in a much harder stone to protect it. Uh, the joins are almost invisible in a lot of them, even though the stones are massive and made of uh, very hard material. Uh, the, the structures themselves are difficult to understand. They don't seem to have any obvious purpose, except that they seem to be constructed for the ages. And it looks like in a lot of times, these people that were doing these projects got almost to the end of the project and didn't quite complete it. And it also looks like they were using tools that we don't really have any understanding of. They don't match any known tool marks, but they were making these beautiful objects. And yet every time we see that they left the project unfinished. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> no questions. I don't, I'm not taking any questions. <laughs> I don't have any answers. <clears throat> I, 
I got bravo, I got answers. <laughs> bravo. That's all Thank I got to say. You. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so. I won't be interrupting him at the Cosmic Summit, so it'll be a shorter presentation. <laughs> yeah, hey, that was only an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. So, yeah, when, when Kyle shuts up, I can do it in 15 minutes. Yeah, he can do it in 15, 15 minutes. minutes. <laughs> and if I don't, I'm like, oh, but the last time you said something really cool. <laughs> in 50, <laughs> if it were one. <laughs> yeah. But that was actually, I, I'm glad you pointed that out because, yeah, like, you're, you're right. Last time you said something really cool, I need to not forget that. <laughs> You're right. I I see I I saw some new stuff this time too, like in the in the Osirian, um, looking at the the changing of the angle of the walls and st- I, I I just I'm well. Let, look, let's take a break. We'll switch to the regular camera, mm-hmm. and then we'll talk about it. Okay. All right. Back, ladies and gentlemen, brothers of the Serpent Podcast, returning from the unfinished presentation. And uh, wow, it was great. Longer than normal, but no big deal. And uh, yep. I, I, I saw new things. Like I was saying at the end there, I, was, I couldn't remember exactly what we saw. But we went, during the break, we looked again at some of the stuff in the Osirian where they were flattening the wall. And uh, I just realized that much like the um, the granite casing stones on the Pyramid of Mincare, that this angle, like as you pointed out in the in the presentation, this very precise angle would have had to have been uh, surveyed in some way and known. Yeah, because the walls, the 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 they're interior walls, but they're on the exterior of the structure, mm-hmm. right? The 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 out the outside walls. Uh, that's weird to try to say that. Yeah. Anyways. This structure has no outside because it's underground. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's an inside wall, but it is the outside wall of the structure. Right, right. <laughs> um, they are slightly tapered or tilted outward. So as the wall goes up, the room gets wider. Yeah. Right? The, the columns are tapered down as they go up so that that if you were to measure... The columns from, are slightly smaller as you go up. As you go up. So if you measure from the bottom, at the bottom of the column to the bottom of the wall, it's, you know, say it was it was 20 feet. If you measure from the top of the column to the top of the wall, it's going to be more than 20 feet. Because yeah. the, the wall is leaning out and the column is tapering down. Yeah. So this, in order to maintain that precise angle of the wall... It would have had to have been surveyed. Or the tool that is flattening that wall has to be guided. Yeah. Because this wall is very long. So if you know you're going to come in. It's extremely tall and extremely it's very long. Lo- it's very tall, very long. Yeah. And, it, and you start in a corner and start flattening. First, you're trying to maintain this vertical angle, this yeah. tilting out. But then you also have to have the angle right. All the way pointed down. Pointed down the wall, right? Yeah. There's, a, there's a 90 degrees from the other wall. And as you go down, like say if they if they were at the wrong angle, flattening at the wrong angle, they'd start digging deeper and deeper into the stone, or maybe dig shallower and shallower, and then they're no longer touching the stone at the other end if it was a straight line. Yeah. So I just don't see how this could be done by hand along that entire surface, unless there were they had some amazing surveying tools. And then if I mean if this is being done by hand, you have to check. At every, I mean, like if you're doing this with a chisel. How do you check it? How do you check? You have to check like, well, let me stop after I hit the hammer on the chisel one time. And like, did I go too deep? Yeah. And you can't correct it. If you go too deep, it's too deep. Yeah. Then the wall is going to be full of divots. And this is the other thing. And maybe I should, I just don't know. Like, this is the thing. Like, because of the time constraints, there's a lot of things I want to say in this presentation. And I just can't, I have to, like, limit myself. But another thing I would, 
that is great to point out with that particular area with the wall itself. And then and since we're getting into the idea of like the tool needs to be guided is because the tool marks for flattening the wall are still there. We know the job wasn't complete and yet there aren't any chisel marks. Yeah. In other yeah. words, there's n nowhere on that do you see anything as recognizable chisel marks, and yet we know the job wasn't done. So, like, it's not like you can say, well, they came and polished the chisel marks out of there. No, no. they were still doing it. Yeah. No yeah. polishing of the chisel marks was being done. It just isn't chiseled. Right? It's, it's, it, it seems obvious that what we're looking at are the tool marks, and they aren't chisels. Right, because that curve where the tool, like you said, lifts off of the wall, yeah. that's, there's, I there's mean, no, it's, there's no chiseling it's there. At, it's, it's, um, it's smoothness mm -hmm. is at the same level of smoothness as the finished wall. Right. Yeah. So that even the curve going out is as smooth. Yeah. Like, and, and technically that's an unfinished surface. Right. Yeah. It's, yes, that's right. And so it's it's it just seems like it's more evidence. You that wouldn't go in with a with a with a finishing like let's say you chiseled it flat, roughly, and it, but but it's rough, right? Yeah. The, but the chisel work's going to leave a rough. It's going to be a rough, very rough surface. So then you go and say, well, we've got a flat surface now, but it's rough. So now we're going to grind on the rough surface until it's until it's not as rough. Yeah. Right. It's more smooth. Well, you wouldn't grind down to the curved part where the chisel was digging down Especially because the... the chisel is intending to come and remove that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. It, it just, that isn't what's happening. Here. Right. This it's is, not what's this happening. This is beyond chisels, yeah. folks. Another thing that I, I just remembered, when you're talking about the the flattening of the of the pillowiness at the corners, right? You, you have this block. It's sitting there in the corner. And then you flatten it, and that makes it, quote unquote, go around corners. Yeah. This is not. It, it, I guess it initially I'm thinking like, well, you flatten that, and then the the block goes around the corner. But if you laid down this this pillowy block, really, the the other angle, the other wall that's ninety degrees to this wall also has pillowy blocks. Yeah. So you can't actually get to the corner. So you flatten one wall, but not all the way that you're trying to go. Then you have to flatten the other wall, and then the corner actually has this bulk that you have to yeah. keep removing from both sides. Yeah. Yep. So it's a and and I'm I'm like I need to look in the corner and see if I can notice, or is it a corner cutting tool? You yeah. see what I'm saying? Because yeah. a corner cutting tool would be cutting yes. at on both faces of ninety degrees, and you can plunge it towards the corner yeah. and go up and down. Yeah. Start but, from the top and yeah. go down the corner. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But if you if you only had, you know, a flat tool that you're just working on one angle. Yeah. You would have to flatten and you got pillowy stuff next to you while you're flattening yeah. on this side. Then you'd have to turn and flatten that pillowy stuff. Yeah. You got to work your way all the way back to and the corner. And then you have to go back find. and kind of push the you yeah. got this little chunk sticking out. Yeah. So this is yeah. Did they have a corner tool yeah. <laughs> that could work both <laughs> angles of that wall? That was the other thing I thought of. This is not. This is why we need to actually make this out of wood, like just to just to show that like yeah. this is. It's not a simple operation. Yeah. 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 I mean, the diagrams I drew, I was really realizing that as I was drawing the diagrams, like I was like, I can't make these too pillowy because then I can't actually fit them together, right? Like, mm -hmm. and then. Wherever their the blocks are sitting against each they other, have to that be surface has to be it's faced. faced. So yeah, the, the, you've got pillowiness on on, and then and then where the where the other block comes to connect to it, they've already flattened. It. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But they know that they're actually going to flatten it the other way. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. The so cor they make so the they corner make this... is actually an imaginary position inside one of those stones. Yes, yeah, in the block, they make this beautiful flat surface. So you have this huge block, and then this. One part that's, you know, however deep, it's as deep as this block is on mm -hmm. this wall, is beautifully flattened, and there's still all this pillowiness, but you know the corner is actually back here right. somewhere. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, it's just, this is... It's awesome. <laughs> it's it amazing. It is really cool. <laughs>
But the fact that the, the other thing about the the Osirian is that the depth at which they're flattening is not nearly oh, yeah, yeah, as yeah, yeah. deep as the pyramid. But still, it's a couple inches. It is a That's couple a lot inches. of stone. It, it is, yeah. and I mean even up to four and in, five inches, probably yeah. more. Yeah. But you know, not two feet mm. like they were doing on the pyramid. Right. But my point in that is that if you had two feet to work with, you could be off on your angle a little bit as you're traveling down the wall. Yeah. And have room to come out. Yeah, like, you know, you got the pillowy yeah, to stone make some corrections and you go this yeah. way, and you keep drifting and drifting until yeah. you have more material sticking out that yeah. could be removed or not. But because they're only removing, in some cases, yeah, you have a, you have a very small margin of error. Yeah, you can't get that <laughs> initial angle very wrong at all. No, it yeah. has to be very precise. Yeah, and I just don't see a way that that tool could not have. It, it had to have been. Um, it had to be controlled. I mean, yeah. it had to be uh, guided. It has to be guided somehow. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the other thing, and I didn't mention this, and I, I, I intend to mention this uh, at the summit because I will be connecting my presentation to the stuff Ben talks about. Uh, but many of you are familiar with Ben's work, especially the stuff he's been doing with the vases and Alex Dunn. They're scanning these vases that are what in private collections. What was guiding the tool? Yeah. And Chris Dunn, right? What was guiding the tool? Chris has already done a bunch of work on precision work in Egypt. Now there's like really good evidence that somebody in the deep past was making precise objects with guided tools, you know. So part of my presentation is saying, so now we it's, it's legitimate to take another look at these structures, right? Because we have really good evidence that somebody had precision guided tools in the deep past. I mean, deep past. Yeah. Okay. Not, not, not 26th century BC, but like 14,000 BC. <laughs> okay. We need to get our eyes on those vases that yeah. came from that tomb. Yeah. So it, it, at the very least pre-dynastic, right? So, yeah. So that's the part of the presentation. The whole point is, is like, we're, we may be looking at, you know, we've thought this for a long time, but now we have even better evidence to say, now we can go back and look at these structures again and question these methods. And actually let's, let's try to decipher what they were doing. This is, this is really our goal. You know, we're yeah. looking at these sites as builders. We've done construction. And so whenever you're going into a place, you're looking around and you're looking like, okay, you know, how do they do that? Or like, look at that interesting thing up there. Mm -hmm. And so, we, we do that at every site we go to in Egypt, and we noticed all these things, and that's all this stuff in the presentation. It's not my stuff. I'm just presenting it. This is You do a great job. It's a result of Kyle and I discussing this, and you guys have heard the discussions because we do them on this show. We do them off air as well. We t I mean, many times at work, we're like, we're like, look, yeah, you can't do this with a block that looks like that, right? I'm like, well, if you drill down, no, man, it has to be like that. I'm like, yeah, you know what? You're right. This is it. So, but you guys have heard the discussions. This presentation is attempt, an attempt to get it out there in a concise form. And it's just really awesome how it's coming together, especially combined with Ben's work, because yeah. this, I really feel like that work, you know, that these guys are doing. Uh, and then Mark Vist. The, mm -hmm. the analysis he's done, all of this is just saying, this is a legitimate thing that we're doing here. Like saying, look at this. There's also evidence for large scale power tools that were working on enormous structures, not small vases, but that somebody was using this same kind of uh, technology and know-how on extremely large structures that for a long time maybe may have been attributed to the wrong culture. Yeah. So... Or, I mean, yeah. yeah. One of the things we were discussing in the, you know, this this idea about how do you maintain, like, this, you've got this very slight taper on the columns that makes them narrower at the top. And then you've got this extremely slight taper on the walls that makes them a little wider at the top. So that, so that is, it's weird when you're walking around in the Osirian. The area you're walking around in has the least amount of space. Yeah. And when, you, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, this is beautifully done, like in, in, in terms of architecture. When you look up, everything for short it's, it's, it shrinks away from you, right? Because yeah. it's further away. But yet, the the walls when you look up are going away from you, and the top of the column is going away from you, so that it kind of corrects for a little bit of that. Yeah, it does this weird, it's, it's a strange thing. Yeah, because you would think that they need to get wider for it to correct for that narrowing. But when you're standing in there, it, everything looks 
straight until you back away and it's pay the attention. Space, it's the empty space that yeah. is maintaining its... Yeah, the empty space is larger up there, but it, w because of perspective, would look smaller. So yes. it actually looks like it's the same size. And then you look at the column, you're like, no, that thing is getting smaller. <laughs> yes. The wall's tilting outwards. So yeah, it does. it <laughs> plays the perspective trick on the empty space. Yeah. It's a little bit larger up high so that it looks the same size as what you're standing in. But it's yeah. still weird. And I, I, you know, this is the other thing I wonder about. What poor jaunts did they send down in there to flatten out those ceiling blocks? That's a terrible job. <laughs> I mean, you better I be think, in a, you I, better I, be in a shielded. <laughs> I think, and I've, I've, I've thought about these ceiling blocks a lot. I think that they were uh, surfaced prior to being oh, yeah? put on the site. I think, I think you the don't top, think they were set down there pillowy? No, I think the tops of the walls were were flattened, mm. and that the ceiling blocks were flattened on the underside. Okay, and set on there because they don't go around corner. Nothing goes around corners on those ceiling blocks. Not the, those three. Yeah, the uh, uh, the lintel stones over the doorways definitely were mm -hmm. cut after they were laid. Yeah, right. But when you go, when you go, there is one doorway you go through with a giant lintel across the top, and it's. It's been cut, the, but you're right. So that's the doorway entrance. Yeah. The door is is cut taller than the lintel stone is sitting across. Mm -hmm. So it has to go up into the lintel stone. And some of the blocks that are on the ceiling, they come they come down and they go around that corner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but and you're right. None rooms. of those giant blocks that are maybe all they the do. way at the maybe roof. I you're right. But there's only three of them. Yeah, but but also you you see the. I don't know what to call them, beams that go across the tops of the columns yeah. that are actually the supports for the ceiling blocks. Yeah. They look very square and they don't You're go right. around corners. So I, I, I'm, I'm that's, assuming yeah. that yeah. they were... Maybe they were finished before putting it in place. Perhaps. And that's I, the other thing. I, I took this out of the presentation, but some of those beams look like they may be... Keystone Like cut. keystone tongue and groove slid onto these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have a they How do have you like even, a dovetail. Yeah, that would be the top of the column. Actually, has some protrusion, like a nub or something. That yeah, the, that the beam is dovetailed. Is not is like socketed into. You know, it's incredible. Yeah, it's <laughs> again, and it's you know, like I said in there, it really is. It's like walking around in the basement of a of a of a skyscraper. It's like just giant point, columns. Everything looks like it's, it's designed to hold enormous amounts of weight above it. Yeah, the other really good point is that these um, channels full of water, like if they were excavated and dug out, yeah. that they they're might deep. They'd yeah. just be deep, and it's not something you'd step down. Yeah. So it's like, well, if I if if it was made to be walked in, and then you're looking up, it's strange that the there's yeah. this whole like upper floor level. Yeah. That's kind of not doesn't have a whole lot of walking space. Right. Yeah. You would. I don't know. It's just. Doesn't look. Uh, I mean, it's exactly what you're saying. Doesn't look like you're supposed to be down there, right? There is supposed to be a few people down there. Yeah, the maintenance but guys. Yeah, <laughs> the dudes in the basement. Yeah, they're like yeah. specialists. Yeah, <laughs> they got a union. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to talk to you. They got shit to do. Yeah, you got. You know, they have they have one single piece of clothing that That's covers right. the, most of their body except their head. That's right. And it says it's Johnson. Yeah, it says Johnson. <laughs> right. <laughs> kind of burly. Yeah. If you're not wearing one of those, they're like, hey, what are you doing? Yeah, what, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you're not supposed to be down here. Get back upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It is a strange place. I did I did also notice in your overview picture how uh well aligned it is to the temple of Seti the First. Yeah. And that makes yes, me the think, angle is the same. Yeah, that makes me think that this was not an accident. That, I thought the same thing when Ben, yeah, Ben mentioned it on the live stream we did with him earlier. And I, and you know, I used to say this, and you pointed out to me several times. You're like, bro, I don't know, and you're right. Uh, it's it's aligned to the center of the width of that, you know. But I think it's foundations. It's, you know, they dig in foundations. They could have changed their orientation. Yeah, to, they to could have. They it. could have matched their temple to it. But it, it seems like they. Well, I thought about it a bunch. I think that you were initially right, and that the reason it seems the 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 best possible the best explanation, the most likely one seems that Seti and his engineers 
knew the Osirian was there because there's something sticking out of the sand. Mm. Uh, and we can say that perhaps in Seti's time, there were a lot more ruins. And the, the Osirian itself may have, at least the, the section we walk around in was far more complete. Mm-hmm. And there may have been another Something level sticking out on the top, sticking yeah. out above. So yeah. we are actually looking at a basement, yeah, or at least the first basement because there's a sub basement and maybe a, a sub sub basement. Yeah, yeah. But possibly there were giant granite columns sticking out of the sand, and said he wanted to build his temple to the gods. Right? Does this make kind of makes sense? Yeah, I I agree. He's it's like, this is the work it, of the gods. Right. Strange that it's L shaped. It's just, yeah, that is a little weird. <clears throat> it's because those temples are those those kind of things are normally just a long mm-hmm. rectangle. It, it, they don't have this weird angle change. So it does look like they they had this afterthought of like, well, we want to put more chapels in, and we we have to go this way because the Osirians in the way. But the temple itself is connected to the Osirians, so they yeah. found it. Yeah. They either knew about it already, or they intended to connect to it, and they matched its alignment, which is the picture that I show is north south it's that picture is aligned north and that they have this strange yeah like a 45 almost yeah. or something yeah greater. yeah very interesting yeah so it's a good question you know what did said did he know and it's interesting also because this is all happening right around the time of ramses the second right uh said ramses is said son so that's the whole thing. Like, Seti dies. This is the story. Seti is building the temple. He's connecting it to the Assyrian. He dies before it's completed. Ramses, his son, comes in to do the completions. That's why Ramses is, like, drawing his it's name crazy. much deeper over his father's name in the temple itself. It's wild that his name isn't carved deeply into those columns in the, in the yeah. Assyrian. There's some. There's there's a quite a beautiful set of glyphs in the pathway going to the Assyrian. Mm-hmm. And there's a beautiful, beautiful set of glyphs in one of the uh, vaulted chambers alongside of the Osirian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it looks like it's it's either that vaulted chamber was a, an, was originally part of the Osirian, and those guys went in there and carved their glyphs in there because it's way easier. Yeah, it's a limestone. Yeah, yeah. Or they actually made that vaulted chamber and carved their glyphs in it. I don't know which one it is. Um, it's hard to say. Yeah. But yeah, there's some there's some. There's a beautiful king's list on the way to the to the Osirian. You know, like a like a pyramid text style right. king's list on the way. But all of this was corrupted by Ramses. He came in there afterwards and wrote his name on things and screwed stuff up. Yeah. And, and then later, you know, I would love to know what it looked like when they were doing that. If only we had their blueprints, you know, like <laughs> I know. Where are their plans? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> uh. But yeah, that's why you, that's things, probably why you have the palimpsest in the in the uh, the famous one in in SETI that shows that like what it looks like the helicopter and shit because you know it's like you you carve that in and then somebody plasters over it and then carves in a, another set of glyphs into the plaster then the plaster all falls off and both of them are overlaid mm-hmm. and it looks like a, a a hovercraft and a helicopter and a tank <laughs> really well aligned overlaid carvings I yeah would say. yeah it is really weird like the the idea of overlaid glyphs is an interesting explanation and i've seen people sh- say like here's the first set of glyphs here's the second set yeah. this is a seti glyph this is a ramses glyph you put them on top of each other and combine them and you can see the shapes yeah yeah um that's a pretty i mean that's a pretty ingenious discovery yeah honestly yeah it's just wild that the that the people who put the plaster over it then redrew the lines that they were right over top of yeah you know yeah it's just Uh, ramsey's doing his thing man (laughs) (laughs) yeah i i do love the um these features that you you know just that they speak to you you know the features in the stone themselves yeah uh it's not it's not an answer to the story uh but it is it's like little little crumbs yeah and clues and really they just it's like a logical progression that you have to to work through to to kind of get rid of the things that it can't be in terms of the methods used and that really just i just it leaves you with a 
it's it's astonishing. Yeah, you know what must have been uh, the things that they did. The the amount, like you say, the amount of stone that they had to remove after excavating or or cutting these stones out of the quarry with way more mass than there was than was ever going to be in the finished product. Yeah, handling that all the way, all those miles, bringing it to the site, lugging it up on the side of the pyramid or the building wall or whatever, and then the immense effort it must have taken, or at least um, maybe it wasn't effort in terms of like, you know, human Like sweat manual labor, and right? Manual yeah. labor, but the, the amount of <laughs> No, energy. some guy was like, beep, 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 <laughs> Yeah. And he's like, The oh. amount of energy and force <laughs> That was needed to remove all that material. I mean, that's a, yeah. a lot of force. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. a lot of energy. Um, a lot of energy and force was expended in some way. Yeah. And then the removal of the removed material. Because yeah. it, it would have been a mountain. Yeah. Of if it turned it to dust or if it turned it to, you know, sand goo. or gravel or <laughs> goo. <laughs> Doesn't matter what it turned it into. It, it turned was a it lot. into geopolymer. <laughs> it's a lot of geopolymer it turned it into. That's the other thing. Uh, well, almost every time I give this presentation to groups of people, the question of the tools comes up. And I, I just, all I can say at this point is I have no idea what the tools were. Yeah. All I can, but, you know, I'm just trying to do the Snake Bros thing of let's go through and determine what isn't happening. You know? Yeah. Well, and then, <laughs> and then refine our questions. Yeah. Right? And part of that is tell, is, is being able to say what tools. We're not used. Yes, that's right. Yeah. What isn't happening is chiseling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least not like we normally associate chiseling, you know, with somebody with a hammer, like a primitive, you yeah. know, like a you got a hard metal chisel and a hammer, and then you're like beating on the stone with it and using like just basic force application. Mm -hmm. That's not what's happening. Right. So right. <clears throat> and you know the the other marks the 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 feather and wedge technique you know I went and read a whole bunch of stuff about this it's it's called feather and wedge or or punch and feather depending on whether you're using a wedge or just a a round rod um and yeah it's been it's it's a known technique it's still used today uh it's it works very well for splitting stone it's a fairly cheap method mm -hmm. right with minimal effort. Yeah, you can see some videos uh, online of guys doing this yeah. with massive boulders, and they fall apart, and it's scary. You know, yeah. Because you don't know which way that yeah. the, the two pieces are going to go. Yeah. <laughs> and you they can run hear, off. You know? Yeah, and there's it, especially when they're using the metal ones, it's got this great, the, the sound yeah. keeps progressing. It's like ding, ding, Yeah, changing ding, tone. Ding. Yeah. <laughs> and then... It splits the thing, yeah, and it's a cool application of force. You know, I I had diagrams. I took all this stuff out because I can't spend too much time on it. But it's cool. It's like stone has immense crush strength. Yes, and not very much, relatively speaking, tensile, tensile strength. strength. So the feather and wedge method uses the stone's crush strength against, against its, its tensile, tensile strength. strength. Exactly. But that means you have to have something that is harder. Than the stone, it has to. Yeah, it, the, it has to. It, it has to be harder than the crush strength of the stone, because right. otherwise, it has the to thing you're trying to yeah. crush against the stone is yeah, getting crushed. Is getting crushed, right? Which is why I have a hard time buying the wooden wedges with water method. I would like to see somebody do this. You know, they're like, oh yeah, they take a wooden wedge and you, so you make all these. They yeah, make I, all these divots, I, you drive the wood in there, and then you pour the water on it and wait for the wood to swell. I understand, but but now you're talking about the crush strength of water. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a it's yeah, you can't crush water. Exactly. Yeah. So. It's hydraulics. Yeah. But the wood has to capillary action. Yeah, the wood, has to, yeah, the wood has to absorb it. <laughs> yeah, and that's yeah, I know. Uh but it but it does this. So I, I buy it. I buy it. Did, yeah. Did you I just want to see somebody do it. I all right. <laughs> All right, I'll do it after. I'm I not play. completely. I'm not I totally understand. not buying it, but I'm like, show me. I, I understand. I, I've watched it. a lot of videos and seen a lot of stuff and demonstrations of people doing it with metal tools, yeah. or even, even like small wooden slivers, and then driving a metal rod yes. in there. But that you yeah. know. But the point is, if the feather can be wood, sometimes because all you need is enough material in there, and then the metal goes in. It just it it overpowers the the, the stone. Right, but I don't know about this. Uh, I don't know about this. <laughs> you fucking drive some wooden wedge and then pour water on it. 
Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it works on softer stone, I mean, too. it does break stone in, like, in houses and stuff like that when there's, like, a, you know, you have a concrete or something and there's, like, a piece of wood. I, I Yeah. Not necessarily solid pieces of granite. But yeah, when the wood gets wet and it you know, swells, it starts suck. It, it starts the capillary action pulling the water into it, and yeah. it swells, and it will it'll crack. Yeah, tiles. Yeah, it'll cracks. You know. Yep. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it does possible. This. That may be why they're so close together. It breaks You'll, glass. You notice you know, that the a picture, window frame does this. It break. Yeah. It'll break the glass inside it. You notice that the the pictures I showed of the modern mm. feather and wedge, the the holes that they made they drilled for the 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 feathers are far apart. But the ones we're looking at in the ancient quarry, they're right next to each other and they're big. Yeah. So that may be, you know, like if you had that many wooden wedges and they're that close, then you can probably create a fracture point along all of them. But, mm -hmm. you know, you can't... The thing with the feather and wedges, they they keep driving it in farther. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't do that with the wood. Uh -huh. You get it in there, it's all mashed and p yeah. pounded and the whole top starts to mushroom out. Yeah. And then you just pour water on it and hope. Yeah. You know. Uh, it would be... Especially some of the breaks in that quarry. Yeah. They're huge. Yeah. It's hard to imagine. Yeah. And in the end, you have to have iron tools to make those notches. Yeah. You're not making those notches with a wooden wedge. Yeah, you might as well. Yeah. So might I just well don't understand this whole wooden thing. I'm like, yeah. wow, dude, you've already got iron to make the notches themselves. You might as well use iron to split it. Right. Yep. That's, yep. Yeah. But that. possibly they did. They were like, I have one iron chisel <laughs> and I have a shitload of wooden wedges. So. <laughs> yeah, you would need a lot of iron yeah. to, to do that. Yeah, maybe. And iron is <clears throat> iron is expensive compared to wood. So, but anyway, I love the, I love looking at the modern techniques and looking at the understandable chisel marks and the fact that there's, I do think it's weird that there's comb chisel marks on existing granite in the quarry. That's it could just, have been a piece of work, too. Uh, you know, like that, that 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 piece was actually planning to be taken right, out. Right, but that's usually, the comb chisel is what you do like the finish work. when it's being finished because mm -hmm. it's going to get damaged, right? So, yeah, you take it to the quarry. To, you take it from the quarry to the site. It's all rough, and then you get it in there, and then you clear the, the outsides, and then you give it that comb effect yeah. as the last thing. This is the finish. So it's just interesting that there's comb work. It they, is. They were practicing. I don't know. But who knows? The quarry has been used by so many people for thousands of years. So. Yeah. And there's another wall um, that we got to go into. Uh, well, there's this huge pit that they think, you know, they were going to lift the obelisk up and move it over. And, and there's this big pit where they thought well, the Nile would have flooded into this area inside yeah. the quarry. Well, that pit has this massive flat wall. Oh, yeah, yeah. With all those lines coming all the way down. I yeah. mean, it's huge. And at the very top, it actually sticks out yeah. towards you. Yeah. Like... <laughs> like they got down into the trench and they're like, we need to go out a bit. We need a little wider working area or something. I don't know. Yeah, so it's... It, and it's very flat. Yeah. Like, you you had a picture in the in the, um, in the presentation of of one of the these flattened walls, but you can still see the little yeah you know striations going down. Yeah, this one is three, four times the height of that wall. Yeah, and it's just huge. And this is the one with the glyphs on it, right? Yes, it's yeah. got all the all the uh, birds drawn all over it or whatever. Yeah. In, in red ochre. And these are like prehistoric drawings, <clears throat> prehistoric style hmm. drawings, prehistoric drawings. Yeah, yeah, it's the same. It's the same kind of like. Uh, rock art that you see out in the deserts that were that are considered to have been done by you know like like a hunter gatherer people and when it was still savannah one of the things that i think would be cool to do there you know if you could get the proper measurements is to kind of figure out what the what is the buoyancy of the water that can fit in that channel yeah can i mean not buoyancy is it, gonna, is of it the really water. yeah but but what size structure would you need, like size yeah. barge would you yeah. need to to have the buoyancy to hold that obelisk <laughs> above water? <laughs> and is that channel big enough? Mm -mm. I don't think it is. No. Because that the whole idea is that they, oh, yeah, they, they just were going to lift it up and, you know, float yeah, it on this it barge, on barge right yeah. here in it's this channel. And I'm, I was in yeah. that channel. I'm just thinking, I don't think this channel is big enough. Right, no. 
Like, how big does the barge need to be? Can the channel get deep enough? Yeah. Right? Because how much displacement That's do you what require? I mean. Yeah. You know, the barge has to displace more water than the, than the obelisk. Than the, than the weight of the obelisk. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's either not wide enough or not deep enough. I mean, yeah. you just ground the boat. Yeah. It would ground the, the boat, yeah. Thing. If you could fit a barge in that was big enough to hold the obelisk, it would just sit on the floor. It yeah. Would, yeah. No. I don't buy it. <laughs> just like I don't buy the pounding <laughs> that's stones. That's the other thing that's not even addressed yeah. in this presentation is like, how did they move? He's gigantic. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. We just take, we you just say, we, we, you just say they were moving them. Yeah. You, that's the thing <laughs> is you, we don't have, there's no evidence for whatever they were doing to move these things. Yeah. There's right. just not, the, and, and that evidence doesn't really exist in the construction methods. Yeah. Other than that there's a block laying in the middle of yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So you know they were. Yeah. They <laughs> weren't know, like, like materializing them in place, right? They, they were moving the blocks. <laughs> they definitely were. <laughs> There's no skids underneath it. Right. It's uh yeah, you gotta deal with you gotta deal with what's there. And so it's it's this is one of the things that I've I've seen you deal with when giving the presentation is like the questions about what's not there. Yeah. The tools. Yeah. Those aren't there. Right. You know, whatever they were using to move it, whatever they're using is not there. Is not there. Yeah. So it's it's uh it's great that you don't that you don't go there, you don't speculate, but it's it sticks to what is there. Yeah. And what eliminates we can what can't be. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and also I think does some pretty good defining of like what must have been. Must but must have been. Yeah. yeah. It's great. You point you, that kind of stuff. Yeah, you point out you point out features, and you're like, "Look at these. We see these features here and here, and at this site, and at this site, and then we now we're looking at very different objects, and yet look, they have these features, they have these things, right? These patterns match, uh, and then it's across the world, and you see the same features, mm -hmm. <laughs> the same patterns, the same techniques. Yeah, and I had never really made that connection with the the vertical sort of. Like putty knife, yeah, striations at you know uh, Saxewama and, and Oyante Tambo, Oyante Tambo. Yeah, and I, I know there's some at uh, Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. That guy that was on the tour with us in Turkey yeah. showed us a picture. I don't, I I looked they there are everywhere. In, they are inside the Serapian boxes. I have video of that. They're in the Serapian boxes. Yep. I mean, clear. I mean, like at, up up against the wall of the inside of one of the boxes, and shine the light down, and just boom, there they are. Yeah. Boom, boom, one after the other yep. going down. It's like this is the same tool. No, we're gonna we're we're gonna we're producing a video on that. And yeah, and the other thing about that is, this uh, you know, Marty and and Chuck had presented the uh, the possibility that this was like like some kind of rotating you grinder. Know, of course, and Marty to Marty is saying like I'm using. Tools that we have, like, yeah. like you know, a, a, the idea of a spinning disc, right? Yeah. Like, we're not making up some fantastic tool like I was doing. It's right. like, oh, it's a, yeah. you know, sonic resonant chisel <laughs> flat. Yeah. On an articulating arm that's controlled yeah. by a computer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like, yeah, where's that tool? Because <laughs> that's what I do. I make up tools that don't exist. But um, there's just, it can't, maybe there are some features that could be a spinning disc yeah but there are just some that no no you can't do this with a spinning disc yeah and i don't the, care what chuck says it can't be done <laughs> <laughs> chuck's still gonna do this for me he's, yeah chuck is like oh i could <laughs> yeah he's he's claiming he can do it i'm, I'm waiting <laughs> um, but no i mean the obviously the flattening of the wall is unless you're just turning that disc flat against the wall yeah but but the bottom edge doesn't match. The bottom edge is flat, right? Like where the where the where the tool stops. Yeah. So it would have the radius. Yeah. So it just doesn't. It it can't be those things. Right. Yeah. It's this is why I stay away from the tools. I don't know what the tools are, and I I love the the speculation, but I I well, I feel like we just don't have enough evidence to start defining any tools. No, but but you can say what it isn't, and what yes. I'm saying is is like this is not a disc. Yeah, at least not in all cases. Yeah, you're right. It's not a disc. Yeah. In some cases, it could be a disc, but yeah. in, but at least they had ones that weren't. Yeah, and if it isn't a disc, you're not spinning a square and getting a flat edge. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not spinning. Right. Or it's a drum that's rolling, right? It's yeah. It, 
But then in some cases, that doesn't work. It's, it's That's what, yeah. So dad, when he was looking at, uh, you know, Snake Stash, was looking at, again, at the flattened area of Minkara and that huge radius that's at least on the top three layers. It's not necessarily, on the bottom, there's, it's, it's, it doesn't, that radius doesn't continue all the way down, at least not the front face. It, it may, it's more regular over on the side, but on the north face of the pyramid, the top three layers have this beautiful radius that's kind of continuous down. And dad said, you know, he was like, well, you said it was a, like, you said, imagine putting a belt sander down on it, but he was yeah. just imagining a spinning cylinder yeah, yeah. on the end of an arm. It's like got a, you know, it's holding like this, the cylinder spinning. Kind of like, like a paint like, roller. Yeah. yeah, a paint roller, but it's, it's like rotating and grinding it off. But again, is it a grinding motion at all? I don't know. I just don't, I just don't know. Maybe, but, but, and so maybe, you know, if, because you were talking about how like, okay, so in the quarry, They've got this tool, this tool type, and they're using it all the time. And some of the, and they get worn, and they don't care because they're not making flat surfaces. So in the quarry, your cylinder has become this like tapered, a, tapered yeah. egg shape or, or oblong, and so it's cutting in and making these deep. Yeah, uh, it's, it's t shaped more like a, a zeppelin. Yeah, it's shaped like a zeppelin. Yeah, because <laughs> the corners always wear. Yeah, because you're always trying to like hit that edge, and, and, and then it's like it's worn down and it's got a but zeppelin then, shape. You know, so I I would ask this question: It's like, well, is it being held? You know, it's only being held from one side. Yeah, it's only know. being held from one end. I don't know. Yeah, it's and so the. You, yeah, that's no, it's being held in the middle and somehow spinning <laughs> yeah, the, right through the arm. <laughs> through and the holding. arm that's holding it. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. It's like we're we're not inventing the tool. You 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 look at the at the geometric patterns that are there. Yeah, and you can get rid of what it isn't. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, how it was actually removing the stone, I don't know. But there are definitely flat shaped tools. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, tools that were able True. to make beautiful flat surfaces. Tools that have like that can make the same radius over and over again, which yeah. could also be a flat tool that's just being controlled. Yeah. Yep. This is why I keep going back to the this what I'm calling a chisel idea. Mm -hmm. Because in if you if you put a mechanical controller on that thing, then it can make you know radii. It can yes. make the same radius over yeah. and over or or close to the yeah, and that's what I'm saying. <clears throat> the work that's being done on the vases. That's key. To me, is key, because this is evidence that they could cut very hard stones with high tolerances of precision and deal with all the inconsistencies that is inherent in the stone, in the various hardnesses, in these giant crystal inclusions that they're able to just cut and polish in a beautiful way that doesn't match the crystalline structure itself. Right, these crystal, the, the big crystal inclusions in a piece of granite or diorite or whatever, that crystal has an internal structure that wants to stay square yeah. or hexagonal yeah. or whatever it is. It doesn't want to be polished flat in a random direction right, right. that you're working at it. And yet they've got this these vases where there's these huge crystal inclusions that are like the size of your entire thumb, and they're just in there all over the place in all these random directions, like it is with stone. And yet this vase is perfect. Yeah, you touch it, it feels like glass. And you're just like, how is this possible? Yeah. How did they, how did they work this crystal without shattering it? It mm -hmm. wants to break along its cleavage lines, which matches yeah. its crystalline structure. Yeah. So if somebody can do that, and they can do it to very high tolerances of precision. And, and, yeah, and that's okay. Oh, finish. The I'm just saying, if somebody can mm -hmm. do that, and they can do it to very high tolerances of, of precision with these small objects, then you can imagine that they could easily take whatever tools they were using to do that and make them enormous and cut giant bites out of stone, you know, mm -hmm. without really caring. It doesn't matter how hard the stone is. It doesn't matter what it's made of. It doesn't matter what's in there or how deep or how big the object is because mm -hmm. your tool doesn't care. Yeah. And that's the thing, too, when you you think about a lathe, right? Like, you can make all these curves and these flat surfaces and all, all of that stuff with, yeah. a, with a lathe. Well, flat surfaces, I mean... Straight lines, I yeah. should say. Straight lines. Um, Straight from one perspective. The yeah, other perspective, perspective they're always yeah. round. <laughs> yeah, you slice the vase in half and you've got, yes. you can have some straight lines. You have curves. Um, these can all be made with a flat-edged tool. Yeah. Right, or a or a sharp tool. Yeah. Because the sharp tool it's is just going along. got a specific angle on it. Just but it's being yeah. guided yeah. into a curve. Yeah. Or you can have a curved edge tool that's just plunging in and leaving that radius. Yeah. So 
you can see how like various different geometric shapes can also result in contours and, and other things. Absolutely, yeah. But you can also eliminate some types of tools. Like you can't have a curved edge tool making a 90 degree angle. Right. So that's that's kind of the thing that I that I like to really look at is like yeah. what what can I say about the geometry of this tool? Yeah. And there are some complex geometries in that quarry. That's one of the things I really love about the quarry because they're they're changing, you know, they're they're like the cut goes down, it sticks out, then it goes down again, it sticks out some more. But then to the sides, it's also sticking out and the, and how sharp are those corners and all that, you know, so, so you can really get in there and kind of say, well, this has to be a different tool tip. Yeah. So that's that's the kind of stuff I like to look at. I like the idea of the cornering tool. <laughs> they had a cornering you just got You start from the top of the wall, you just put that thing on there. It's got a spinning thing at the end. <laughs> yeah. And then something that cuts down here is just... Yeah. And leaves this beautiful radius down with a small, you know... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't know <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> and we're at two hours yeah so let's wrap it up okay it's uh it's late yeah, it's for 1 30 in the morning yeah <laughs> yep all right i hope you guys enjoy this show uh sorry for those of you listening just go watch the youtube video i promise you the presentation is worth it with all the, the it visuals is. it's great um yeah. Anything else? I don't know. I'm tired. I'm ready to go. Yeah. Thanks to all the supporters. Thanks yes. to everybody who's uh, supporting us in, in whatever way you can, no matter how much it is or whether you've um, made stuff for us. And all of the things you all do for us. Yeah. It's just Send great. us so, stuff. Join the Discord. Links for the, again, the links for the uh, Cosmic Summit uh, live stream and video will be in the show notes. Uh, yeah. That's it. We love, love you guys. It. Yeah, always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Mm-hmm.